Good design is good business became the motto of the day in the post-war years of the 1950s. Welcome to Chapter 20, Corporate Identity and Visual Systems, where design was seen as a major way to shape a reputation for quality and reliability. The first phase in the development of post-war visual identification came from the efforts by individual designers who put their own personal imprint on a client's image. Remember Peter Behrens and AEG? Well, the Olivetti Corporation was an Italian typewriter and business machine company whose dual commitment to humanist ideals and technological progress dated from its founding in 1908. Giovanni Pintori was the principal designer and he worked for Olivetti for over 31 years, putting his personal stamp on all facets of the company's visual program. Look at the designs of Giovanni Pintori in this slide and the next slide and let me know what was his main strength or ability as a designer. His designs were simplistic and yet fully communicated the high-tech function of the products industrial design and engineering. He was great at using simple graphic shapes to visualize complex mechanisms and processes as demonstrated here by both of these posters. What graphic elements is he using to demonstrate the high-tech function of Olivetti's programs? He ended up receiving international recognition for his commitment to design excellence. The next company we're going to talk about is CBS, both their on-air TV division and their radio division. First, we'll start with the radio division. The Columbia Broadcasting System of New York City moved to the front of corporate identity as a result of several men. First one we're going to talk about is William Golden. He was an art director with uncompromising visual standards. The CBS trademark was one of the most successful trademarks of the 20th century. Fine artists were often commissioned to make illustrations for CBS's ads. In this particular example, the big push shows his high artistic visual standards. I want you to tell me what was unique about CBS's visual program compared with present-day visual programs. He felt that the designer's primary function is to make sure the message is communicated accurately. In 1945, George Olden was hired to create a graphic design on-air visual department for CBS's new television division. He was the grandson of a slave from North Kentucky and the first African American to achieve prominence as a graphic designer before the Civil Rights Movement. His role in graphic design has been compared to Jackie Robinson's in professional sports. He was commissioned by the U.S. Postal Service to create a stamp for the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. Olden was a major figure in defining the early development of TV broadcast graphics. Emphasis was placed on concepts that quickly captured the essence of each program using simple signs, symbols, and images, such as this on-air ad for the I've Got a Secret TV show. I want you to tell me what do you think were some of the graphic limitations of the first televisions. Lou Dorfman became the art director for CBS Radio in 1946, and after William Golden's sudden death, Lou Dorfman became the creative director for CBS TV and eventually the design director for the entire corporation. The CBS approach to corporate image and design was not dependent on a system or a style, but on management's policy toward design and the creative abilities of its design personnel. Raymond Lowy is the next important designer to be recognized because of his involvement in creating comprehensive design systems. In his designs, form followed function. He was a charismatic and visionary designer who had his fingers in a lot of pies, so to speak, in the design industry. He also initiated a study of his audience, the public, attempting to define their needs and wants. He ended up acknowledging that with the public, there was a point at which unfamiliarity bred undesirability. His designs have truly stood the test of time. During the 50s and 60s, American designers and firms embraced corporate visual identification as a major design genre, and Paul Rand became more and more involved in this area. 
he created the visual program for international business machines. With the IBM design program, he wanted to express the extremely advanced and up-to-date nature of its products. He wanted to portray a consistency of design quality that would also become a flexible theme. I need you to tell me what specific qualities did Rand believe a trademark must possess in order to be successful. As an example of this flexibility, Rand designed this poster for an in-house IBM occasion using the Rebus principle. In 1959, he redesigned the Westinghouse trademark. He also redesigned the logo for the American Broadcasting Company. He reduced the information to its simplest essence, which became a memorable and unique image. Rand's ABC logo was an homage to what famous design school, and how was this demonstrated in this particular design? Partly due to Paul Rand, the annual report was transformed from a dry financial report to a thing of visual beauty. The 1958 IBM annual report established the standard for this. In this design, advanced technology and organizational efficiency were expressed beautifully. Lester Beale turned to corporate design during the last two decades of his career. He did programs for companies such as International Paper Company. He contributed to the development of a firm's corporate identity manual, which was a book with guidelines and standards for implementing its design program. This includes information on how the logo should be used, such as on these packages on the left-hand side, or how signage should be displayed, for instance, on the semi-tractor trailer on the right-hand side. Chermeneff and Giesmar Associates developed more than 100 corporate design programs, including a corporate identification program for Chase Manhattan Bank in 1960. This was a completely abstract visual logo, and consistent use of this mark, color, and typeface built recognition value through visual redundancy. This Chase corporate identity system became a prototype for the banking industry. They also created many other memorable trademarks, such as the mobile oil trademark. I want you to tell me what qualities did the principal designers in this firm believe a logo must possess in order to be successful. Saul Bass was another designer who turned to corporate visual identity programs. Here's an example of a trademark his firm did for Minolta Cameras in 1980. He also had a philosophy about trademarks. Please tell me what did Saul Bass believe that a trademark should have in order to be successful. An example of a successful logo is the one that Saul Bass and Associates did for AT&T. After AT&T Long Distance Telephone Network, was split from the local bell system, Bass designed a new trademark to reposition the firm as a global communications company. He showed this by using a computer graphics animation as the identification tag for AT&T. A spinning globe gathers electronic bits of information then transforms into the AT&T trademark. In 1974, the United States government initiated the Federal Design Improvement Program in response to a growing awareness of graphic design. All aspects of federal design fell under this program. Here's an example of the logo used in the upper right-hand corner of this U.S. Department of Labor Standards Manual. This agency wanted to improve visual communications of government agencies with the citizenry of the United States. Part of this federal program included the Unigrid system for the National Park System. This unified about 350 National Park locations through a template for publication and program development. I want you to tell me what were John Massey's goals for this particular program. Planners realized that a comprehensive design system was necessary for big event and large organizations and this was especially true for large world events like the Olympics and World Fairs. The 1968 Olympics held in Mexico was the first large-scale graphic development project of its kind. It was spearheaded by American Lance Wyman and Englishman Peter Murdoch. The logo type here on the left was the first step. The repeated stripe pattern observed in traditional Mexican art was used to form the letters. This design was extended into a typeface that could be used on all promotional materials. He also developed a set of pictographic symbols for athletic and cultural events. These pictographs were used for stamps, informational posters, maps, film titles, and television spots. 
Here is an example of the exterior environmental system. Wyman and Murdoch collaborated on the development of a complete system of modular functional components with interchangeable parts. Color was used in both decorative and sensible ways. Their system was so successful, it was said in a major newspaper that you could be illiterate and find your way along as long as you weren't colorblind. For the 1972 Olympics in Munich, Germany, designer Otto Aker directed a design team in the development and implementation of a more formal design program. An identification manual established standards for the use of the logo. An extensive series of pictographs were drawn on a square grid. One pictograph per sport was designed. These pictographs were used widely in printed graphics and signage. The color scheme was analogous and projected a festive air. The Los Angeles 1984 Olympics was a complete departure from the very beautifully well-designed systems of both the Munich Olympics and the Mexico Olympics. For the Los Angeles Olympics, you had hundreds of designers and architects working for over 60 different firms involved in this Olympic project. This logo was chosen by the LA Olympic Organizing Committee from a competition among LA's leading design firms. And then they made a poster that was a design guide to provide all participants with consistent parameters. Bright colors were used. Graphic forms were taken from the stars and stripes of the American flag. Diverse materials were utilized. Each sports arena was transformed with its own color combination and visual motifs developed from the design guidelines. Entryways into sporting events were festive colonnades. Also, the informational signage system was supposed to be consistent yet flexible. And on top of all this, economic materials were used. When I look at these colonnades and these entranceways into events, I don't think Olympics I think I'm going into a ride at Disneyland or into Oompa Loompa Land. So in my opinion, this was not a very successful design program. Armstrong International Design developed the design program for the Beijing 2008 Olympic Games, which was another beautiful and successful design system. The emblem consisted of three parts, the Beijing game symbol, the logo type, and the Olympic symbol. Pictograms were developed for the Beijing Olympic Games. And I want you to look at these pictographs, and I want you to tell me what was the inspiration for these particular event pictograms. And for this one, you're going to have to go all the way back to the beginning of our course to get your answer. And lastly, let's talk about wanting your MTV. MTV first went on the air in 1981. Media visionary Bob Pittman created the idea of a round-the-clock music TV station at the time when music videos had not reached their first and full creative potential. Manhattan Design, a New York City firm noted for its risk-taking and experimentation, especially in the music industry, created this logo. Incidentally, the TV was scribbled on as an afterthought, and it was Manhattan Design who actually called MTV music television. Here are a few variations of the MTV logo. I want you to tell me why was the MTV logo unique among all logo types, especially at this point in history. So to conclude this chapter, in the last half of the 20th century, visual identity became more important in the information age. The identity of a large organization can be created or redefined by design.